Hey guys and welcome to this episode of Quite Frankly. Today we're going to look at an amazing product, the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. Now who is Wacom? What is Wacom? What is a Wacom? <laughs> if you are into retouching, you probably know the brand. And if you're not into retouching and you do your stuff still with the mouse and you feel crammed up in your fingers, pay attention. Wacom is a producer of you guessed it, tablets. Look behind me, you see a Cintiq, really big tablet. But they also have smaller ones called the Intuos. And you could say they own the market. They are of course competitors, but if you go for pure quality, Wacom is the name. So today, the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro, what is it? Why do I use it? And why am I so enthusiastic about it? First, I have to give you a little bit of insight. Okay, so as a photographer, I love to specialize. And the thing that I specialize in is teaching workshops. I absolutely love bringing information to people. Now, one of the problems is that you need something that's very, very reliable, that's sturdy, and that always works. Now, if you look on the market, it's very easy to see the brand that's, well, very well represented, and that's Apple. Now, years ago, I switched from the PC to Apple. And I absolutely loved it. I never looked back. And that's also why a lot of people say, once you go Mac, you never go back. Yeah, well, things change. And I still love Apple. You could say I'm a little bit of an Apple fanboy. I own a Mac Pro, the R2-D2, trash can according to some, but I love it. I have a MacBook Pro, I have an Apple Watch, I have an iPad Pro, I have an iPad, I have an iPhone. I absolutely love Apple. The thing is, when they actually announced they're going to revolutionize the laptop market and they released their new MacBook Pro, oh my, yeah, that didn't, that didn't go very well with a lot of professionals. My wife has one. I'm still not allowing her to type in my neighborhood because it makes a hell of a noise. And it's very, very small. It's very, very tiny. But it also lacks ports, it lacks, very important, my SD card reader, and most of all, battery life. It went down instead of up. It's still, I think, the best designed laptop on the market. If you hold it, it's the most gorgeous laptop on the market. But it's not a revolution. What I wanted, I teach workshops, I'm in the field. What I want to do is I want to shoot tethered to a rock solid solution, but I also want to be able to just pick it up, get a pen and draw in it. And come on, Microsoft has been doing it with Surface Pro for so many times. It's now, I believe, in the fourth integration and it, it works. So when Apple said we're going to revolutionize the laptop market, I didn't expect the emoji bar because actually that's how I call it. It's an emoji bar, emoticons. And that's what you see in all the releases with Apple now. Okay, we're going to release Mario. We're going to uh, release new emoticons. And now you can even choose the color of the emoticons. We're going to release this. We're going to release that. Hello? Hello? We're the guys that made Apple. We're the professionals. We're the creatives. We're the guys that actually need new gear. And then you get something like that. And we have the awesome Apple Pencil. And then you see that big trackpad and you go like, wouldn't it be awesome if you could take that pencil and put it on the trackpad? And it didn't work. I almost ordered my 15-inch MacBook Pro. And then I decided to do something else. And this video, I will give you some information why I am totally hooked and we're actually going to change a lot in our studio. Okay, so in front of me is the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro 16-inch. And here we go. And it's a big tablet. Now, I want to address that first, size. Now, you know the expression, right? Size doesn't matter, it's what you do with it. Well, that's true. Let's, for example, take a 15-inch MacBook Pro. So this is my beloved 15-inch MacBook Pro. Absolutely love it, it's been around the world and it always works. It's very, very stable, it works in every environment. Just a great notebook, nothing against it. This one is, well, it's slightly larger. It's not that much larger. And why did I choose the 16 inch? Because they also have a 13 inch. Now, let me address that first. 
If you're the kind of guy that goes into a coffee shop and just sits down, opens up his laptop and looks very interesting, working to his Excel spreadsheets, probably typing in how many Starbucks coffees you had this month or doing your emails, then the 13 inch is great. It's awesome. In the end, for me, it's all about real estate. I want the biggest space available, but I still want something portable. Because, let's be honest, if you draw or retouch, you want a big screen for your image. Now, a lot of people compare, for example, the 13 inch to the iPad Pro and they go like, but on the iPad Pro, I have more than enough real estate. Do realize one thing, the iPad Pro is designed for touch and it's designed to be the 12.9 inch, meaning all the menus are really small on the side and all optimized for touch. Windows is optimized for touch, but it's optimized. In other words, if you open up Photoshop, you lose a lot of space for the menus on the side with all your layers, for the menus on the side with all your tools, and you end up with something in the middle. This is one of the things that, although I love the surface from Microsoft, I found the surface way too small, because if I've all the menus on the side and the hard keys, more on that later, I didn't have any space left. So if I zoomed in on a model, I only saw a big eye. Now, if I use my tablet or laptop, I'm in a hotel, I'm in the RV, I'm waiting somewhere, so I have more than enough room for a big tablet. So that's why I would advise you, if you're in the market like me, get the 16 inch. If you're more like, you want to sketch somewhere, you want to do your emails, and you want something bigger than an iPad, and you still want to be able to run full-sized apps, and you work on it occasionally, or you can handle the smaller real estate, the 13 inch is great. But the 16 inch for guys like me is absolutely awesome. So try it out before you go like, nah, 16 inch is big, let's go to the 13 inch. Now let's talk about the screen. The screen is a 4K resolution. Now what is 4K? <laughs> it's a lot of pixels, <laughs> a lot of pixels. And it's a small screen. And that's the cool thing about this one. You can sit with your nose in front of the screen and you don't see any pixels. It's an amazing screen. It's really, really great. And the other things that are important, hard keys. Why not the Surface Pro? I've done this video in Behind the Closed Doors and a lot of people ask me, why didn't you just get a Surface Pro? Why? Y you tried one, why did you send it back? The first thing about the Surface Pro, it's a great device. It's awesome. The only thing is, for me it was a little bit too small and there was one vital part missing, hard keys. Now if you look at all the Wacoms, you actually see on the side, you see hard keys and a dial. Now, those are very important. Now, imagine doing retouching in Photoshop and you have your pen. You can, of course, program two buttons on your pen for, let's say, Ctrl and Alt. But what do you do with the spacebar? Okay, you can use touch. You got me there. What do you do with zooming? You can use touch. You got me there too. But how about changing something, deleting a file, uh, sorry, deleting, an, uh, for example, a selection? There are so many things you can do with short keys. And I hear some people going like, yeah, Frank, but come on, you can do that in the menus. It's not a hobby device. This is a production machine. I don't want to go into menus to change stuff. I want to be able to retouch with my fingers here and just press buttons. And they're tactical, so I feel where I am. You feel distinct differences between the keys because there's a little bit of a bump on the bottom ones. And I like to dial so I can zoom in more easily or I can change my brush size. Zooming, by the way, I do with my fingers. And the brush size I can, of course, do very simply with the dial. Also, tilting your canvas can be done with fingers because this is full touch. So that's why I like the hard keys on the Wacoms. Another thing is, and that's incredibly important for me, it has an SD slot reader. So on the field, and I really don't get why Apple removed this from the Pro devices, in the field you can just take out your SD card, put it in, empty the card and do whatever you want. Okay, so a lot of people read my blog and they actually emailed me, Frank, there's one thing that I don't get. You were angry at Apple for losing all the ports and going to USB-C and now you're using a device that only has USB-C. Why? I did explain this online and I want to address it again. Apple removed all the ports, but you didn't get anything back. The thing that you got back is a dongle circus. You have to use all the dongles to connect HDMI, your card reader, Thunderbolt. And remember Apple told you a few years ago, buy everything Thunderbolt 2 because that's the future. Well, we have everything Thunderbolt 2. 
Thank you very much Apple, and now we can do it again in USB-C. And did you see the prices of USB-C devices? It's ridiculous. If you want to get a professional setup with a MacBook Pro and you want to have several monitors and you want to use external hard drives, because you need external hard drives, just try to imagine how many dongles and how many switches you need. We actually thought about replacing a Mac Pro with a MacBook Pro. And we found out that we actually need a lot of switches and a lot of dongles and the four ports are actually pretty short. Now with the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro you only have three ports. Is that a problem? No, because the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro is never intended to replace your desktop computer, which Apple wants you to do. If you see all their adverts, you actually see professional setups with a MacBook Pro and big screen TVs, or sorry, big screen monitors. This is really a device for mobile use. So we have three USB-C ports. One is for charging, well, actually they all three can charge, and you have two more left. In the field, that means for us we charge, we have an external hard drive there to uh, copy all our images that come in, and we have a tethered camera. That means we're full. Is that a bad thing? Not really, because I don't need any more in the field. If I give a presentation, one will be charging, one will be used for HDMI, and one will be used for a presenter, or you use a Bluetooth presenter. Again, no problem. So almost every situation, three USB-C ports are enough. If they would have had two, that would be a little bit tricky because then I run out of space very quickly. And we tried it, you can use all the dongles that also works on your Mac. The only thing that doesn't work, of course, are Thunderbolt devices. Now one of the questions, and this was actually also a breaking point for us, how long does this baby run on a battery charge? Now in the field we shoot tethered, and shooting tethered works, it works flawlessly. The only thing is, we need two Tether Tools boosters for two extension cords. Compare that to the MacBook Pro, we only need one booster. But that's not really a problem, as soon as you know that, you just know you have to use two boosters. And in all honesty, who needs 15 meters of cable? It's because we shoot in the studio. If I shoot on a stage, I often only use one cable, so that means I don't use a booster at all. If we shoot in castles, ruins, or anywhere else, we use two cables, so we only need one booster. But in our test setup, we wanted to see how far can we stretch it. And it was 15 meters with two boosters. Great performance. The only thing was, we found out that if we just janked the power cable out and we put the brightness on full blast, mimicking what we would use outside, the battery runs down in about 3 hours and 15 minutes. Now don't stop the video yet, that's not bad. It's actually pretty good. I didn't expect it for a tablet like this to run that long. How long does a MacBook Pro run? About five and a half, six hours. Remember we're shooting into Capture One, and Capture One is a power hungry beast. It will literally obliterate your battery. And well, then three and a half hours, three hours, 15, that's pretty good. But we need something more. Now Wacom already told us that they need 12 volts on the USB-C and they can handle 5 amps. That's a little bit high. So that also is called Profile 5 for USB-C charging. Now at the moment we're in the middle of searching for a power device that can actually power this baby in the field. And we have found one that certainly works and that's a Godox. But that's a big unit and it's actually a unit that can also power your strobes charge your iPhone and iPad, run a MacBook Pro and the tablet all together and it will still probably run for five or six hours. But if you don't want to carry that one around, we also found another company and as soon as we have that power solution in-house, we're going to do a separate video on that. And that promises to be something similar like the Hyperjuice we use for the MacBook Pros and a lot of guys actually know. They're a little bit smaller, like half size of the tablet and they actually run for about four or five hours extra, meaning you will get like seven hours battery time out of this unit and that's more than enough. For a good workshop and a good shoot, we need to keep this one alive for about five, five and a half hours and that's safe. So battery life without any extra help, be aware. But if you're in the field and you're bringing strobes and everything else, you probably already bring some sort of power unit like the Godox, so no problem there too. If you're retouching on it, the story gets a little bit different. We get about three and a half, four hours out of it. Because when you retouch, and we do that in a darker environment, we also lower the brightness. And when you draw, it actually runs even longer in Manga Studio. 
So battery life is okay. It's not spectacular, but it's okay. Now, one of the things that struck me as really, really cool was that in within about, well, maybe three days, Anna Week showed me something on her computer, on internet, and I already was doing this. And I was realizing, oh no, I don't have touch. Hmm. Okay. So anyway, so uh, let's use the keyboard and the touchpad again. So incorporating touch into your workflow is something that comes very natural. Now, remember that when you were little and you were drawing on a piece of paper, what did you do? You, you came in, you go out, you go in, you go out, but most of all what you did is you actually tilted the paper to make lines like this, tilt it back, tilt it back. This is something that of course you can do with, for example, a Cintiq that has touch by turning, but that never really worked well. It was always a little bit like it worked, but you really have to learn how to use it. And a lot of people actually with Cintiqs turn their touch off. The Wacom Mobile Studio Pro 16 and 13 really changed this. The touch is absolutely great. So within seconds, you're in Photoshop and you start retouching. Now, what are you used to? Yes, you're used to using the dial, changing the brush size, then going down, changing the zoom, going down again, changing the angle, going down again. And at one point, as soon as you start learning it, and th this is the same when you first start using a tablet, you want to go back to your mouse, right? And then when you get used to the tablet, you never want to go back. It's the same with touch. Before you know it, you will only use the brush size and you will have one hand very close to your canvas. You will retouch, put your fingers on the canvas and actually zoom in, zoom out and tilt the canvas. It's a really, really natural experience. So that's awesome. Speed wise, is it a speed monster? This is the i7 with 16 gigs and a 512 gigabyte SSD drive. Let me put it this way. I'm shooting 42 megapixel files. I'm a fast retoucher. I want it to go really, really fast. So I use a lot of filters, which are pretty heavy. And overall, I'm very satisfied with the performance. Personally, for the stuff that I do with the big files, I wouldn't advise you to go for the i5 or 8 gigs. I really think 16 gigs and the i7 with the dedicated video card is a must if you want to do stuff like I do. If you are somebody who works in Manga Studio or draws in Photoshop, you could try with a lesser solution. But with these tablets, the problem is it's a tablet. So don't expect a speed monster. And overall, the experience is really great. But if you have to budget, go for the i7. OK, so you saw the title, right? Why Apple? Well, it should actually be pronounced like this. Why Apple? What do I mean with this? Now, when you saw the introduction of the new MacBook Pro and you read all the interviews afterwards, and I didn't read them all, of course, one of the things that Apple said, we experienced a touch experience that wasn't up to what Apple wants. Or in other words, the experience we have with touch is not something we bring to market. Now, at first I thought like, what are they meaning with this? And I think I know what they mean. If you look at the experiences that Apple has, they remove all the ports. Why do they remove all the ports? Because that's courage. Yeah, okay. Courage to bring all the stuff extra. But okay, let's just leave it at that. I think that Apple doesn't want to release a touch unit until they don't need this anymore. Now, what is this? It's a keyboard. And it's a keyboard with a touchpad. And I think that's a big mistake because Although you have a unit with touch, I wouldn't dream about going home, uh, sorry, leaving home without bringing a keyboard and a touchpad. Because if I want to type in an email, I'm way faster on the keyboard. If I want to do edits in Resolve or Premiere, I want to use the touchpad, trust me. I don't want to do that with my fingers. Oh my, that, that will take hours and hours more. So I think that Apple misses the ball here. If you bring out a device with touch, it doesn't mean you have to lose the keyboard and lose the touchpad. And I think Apple will only release something with touch if they can say, we're going to change the world. Do you see this? This is so 2030. We'll just throw this away. Well, I think in 2030, Apple will go wireless because at that time, maybe we grew extra fingers because of evolution and all the people doing all this stuff on their phones. 
I think Apple really has to leave that idea. Just incorporate touch. Don't remove the keyboard and touchpad, just incorporate it. Because in all honesty, again, when I now use Anoweek's laptop or even my own, I'm putting my fingers on the screen and going like, eh. You know, all the little kids that read comics and books, they're now trying to zoom in and they go like, why doesn't that work? That's the feeling I have now with this machine. So, yeah, I raved a lot about this unit. Is there anything wrong with it? No. And yes. Why did I ever switch to Apple? It's not because I like the design. As a professional, I really don't get all those people that go like, Apple doesn't make any screens anymore, and now the screens are ugly. If you earn your money with photography or video, you don't care about how your screen looks. Come on, even if it's, if it's ugly as can be, it's about the quality, and it's about stability. And I use BenQ screens. They aren't really pretty, they aren't really ugly. But I don't care, they're great screens and they give a great price quality. So I don't care about how a screen looks, I just want something that's awesome, gives me Adobe RGB space. Oh, by the way, the screen in this one is 96 Adobe RGB percentage, awesome. So anyway, so the problem with this one, it doesn't run Mac OS. Aye, 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 I have to go back to Windows. Now, why did I leave Windows in the first place? Let me think, how long can this video take? Not too long, I see Anoui going like, don't make this too long. Okay, the thing I, let, let me put it this way, this is what I like about Mac OS. If you buy a new computer, you just put the old one on, 20 minutes later, you can run the same software that you were used to on the old one. If you have a problem, just reinstall the OS. It happened to me twice in 10 years. You just reinstall the OS, you start up, and you can go back into Photoshop and <laughs> just go on where you left off. Uh, Integration with your iPhone, with your iPad, with context, the, the list goes on and on and on. There's one thing that Apple is great at. Stability, integration and smoothness. Oh my, is an Apple smooth. Windows, my experience, and we have more than 20 years of experience in IT. If it runs, it runs great. If it goes wrong, it goes wrong great. <laughs> You need a lot of experience to change this. For example, if I want to change our gateway for our internet, we have two internets. We have one for ADSL and we have one for 4Gs. Now on the Apple, I can just click somewhere and I can change the address, press apply and I'm done. If I want to do that on the PC, I have to go to my Wi-Fi, click, go to my connections, click, go to my adapter, click, go to the IC, uh, TCP, TCP IP settings, click, change it, click, press apply, click, press OK, click, and then it works. <laughs> and that's only changing my gateway. If I want to make a new, U I don't even want to go there, it's about to walk on. But Windows can be intimidating. When I look at some programs, how they look, they, they look like 1985, I always say as a joke. They're very blocky. When I look at the Mac, it's all smooth. So the experience is different. So why do I bother with Windows? For the very simple reason. The Vaco Mobile Studio Pro is worth it. I get so much more. I get so much more flexibility and so much more power in the field. And I don't have to bring a different tablet and a MacBook. I just can bring this one device. So that's really awesome. Now let's look at some of the accessories we got that really made working with the Waco Mobile Studio Pro a delight. And I can highly recommend you guys to get those devices because you really need them. Now the first thing you need is a keyboard. I highly recommend this one. This is the Logitech K830. It lights up in the dark <laughs> and it has a really cool touchpad and well, in Windows, the touchpad integration is nothing like with the Mac. So you sometimes need these keys because sometimes it works with drag and drop, sometimes it doesn't. Now, if you're a Windows user, you will probably go like, what are you talking about? It works great. Trust me, if you ever worked on a Mac, you know I'm right. So you need these keys. The cool thing about this keyboard is you actually also have a mouse button here. So if you're having your keyboard on your lap and you feel it is a little bit awkward to do stuff like this and hold the keyboard, don't worry. You can just use your touchpad with your uh, thumb and just press the mouse button here. So that really works great. The other thing is, and that's really nice about this keyboard, a lot of the keyboards use a dongle. 
So you lose one of your USB-C ports. This keyboard doesn't, it uses Bluetooth. So you just connect it and it's done. The other thing is, the list goes on, there's no battery. You see this? There's absolutely no battery. Does it run on solar power? Yes, this is a solar powered, no of course not. It has a built-in lithium-ion battery pack. So you just charge it and you can use it. Now, I hate wasting batteries, so what I always do is I use rechargeable batteries. That means if we're going on a holiday or a trip or whatever, I use a charger, I bring batteries, and that is all extra weight. So I really like that in this very, very lightweight, you almost feel like if you throw it up, it will slowly drift down. Of course it doesn't, but it's very light and you just connect it to USB or USB-C and it charges immediately. So that's really cool and it runs pretty long on the battery and I love that the lights go on. That's amazing because often we are in a dark environment and I just really love to see the letters. Is there something negative about the keyboard? Yes. And it's a small thing, but in this case it's a really frustrating thing. If you look at the keys, it looks like a full-sized keyboard, right? And it is, but the keys are maybe one or two millimeters closer to each other. And it means I'm a blind typer, so that means that I don't look at the uh, keys constantly. I just miss the keys very, very slightly. If I'm typing on it for like a day, it goes okay. But then if I switch back to my Mac keyboard or any other full-sized keyboard, I find that it's easier to type and then I go back here and it feels a little bit cramped. On the other hand, come on, this is a great form factor and it really fits nice with the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro, so awesome. The other thing is the speakers inside here are a joke. Sorry Wacom, I love your product, but the speakers are a joke. The first time I actually heard my own voice, I thought I, would, I did something completely wrong. When you hear music, you go like, what's going on? Did I blow up a speaker? It's it's not that bad, by the way, but the sound is very, very shallow. Now, is that important? In most cases, it's absolutely not. Because, well, let me put it this way. If they put in bigger speakers, it would take away from the space for the battery. So, I would prefer the smallest speakers possible. Just make sure that it, you hear sound, because you can edit on it, you just don't hear the quality of sound. Now, my son still had this laying around. It's like a hand grenade. Oops, there we go. Don't throw it around twice. And it's a Bluetooth speaker. It's very, very lightweight. It's small. And again, it charges via an internal battery. I love that stuff. I don't want to carry around a lot of batteries. And it's also Bluetooth. And this one sounds great. Is it a boombox? No, but I'm not a rap DJ, whatever. I don't want big sound. Then I will bring something else. This one will give me great sound quality for on the go and editing some video. And it's actually pretty good. What is it? It's a Philips, that's Dutch, and it's the product, I don't have a clue. Well, we'll put this in the comments below if you really want to know. But it's, it's cool. It's the hand grenade from Philips. Anyway, do you think we can travel with this? It's just a small Bluetooth speaker. It's a small right? Bluetooth speaker, but it looks, it, it looks a lot like a hand grenade. Do you think that the airports will take a problem with this? Duck! No. Now, one of the things, of course, about a tablet is if it lays down, it's very cool to draw on, right? But if you want to type something or you want to read internet, well, you can use the building keyboard, that's great, but if you want to use something else, you need it to stand, and it doesn't. I don't even go there, don't, don't worry. Now, Wacom will release a stand for it, but I don't have to stand yet. So, what we actually did is we have an iPad Pro, which we use in our uh, home situation as a remote control. And we have this little stand from Trust. And it actually works great for the uh, Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. You can put it in different settings. And you can just put it on the table. It's now out of the frame, I know. So I'm going to switch back very quickly. You can just put it here and just place it on here. Now, if you like to draw like this, it's still, as you can see, if you hold it a little bit, like this. It's very, very sturdy. It won't fall down. It really locks in. So cheap solution. And maybe there are other brands that will do the same thing. I would like to have something that's actually connected to the uh, Mobile Studio Pro. So when I travel, I don't have to take it off and carry another device. So it would be great if something can literally connect to it. Okay. Anyway, the other accessory that's really essential, of course, for this tablet is... Ta -ta -ta -ta. The new pen. 
yeah, the new pen. One moment. This is the old pen, and this is the new pen. Looks like Apple. It looks exactly the same, just streamlined. There's one big difference between these two pens. This one is very, very touch sensitive. This one is four times more sensitive. Wow, four times more sensitive. Awesome. Sounds nice on paper, right? How does it transform back into the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro? I'm always honest in my reviews. <laughs> I don't have a clue how it transforms back. I'm not a digital artist. I'm a photography retoucher. I love to take photos and I love to retouch. For me, there is a difference between the pens because I also love to draw. And when I draw in Manga Studio, I do find, and that's really, really nice, that even the slightest touch will give me a very, very faint line. And then when I press a little bit more, the lines get really, really big. And even on this 27 inch Cintiq, it looks different. I think if you give this to a real artist, they will have a ball. I actually saw some reviews online where they said we have to change the sensitivity because it was too much. So I think this level of sensitivity, great. So this is a real improvement. The cool thing is, if I put this one on the Wacom Cintiq, it will actually tell me it's not compatible. So make sure you don't mix up your pens and you go on a holiday with, for example, your Cintiq. No, he won't go on holiday with your Cintiq. Okay, so let's look at some programs that we use and making the switch a little bit easier for you guys coming from Mac to Windows. Now this is where a lot of you guys will actually be in Lightroom. Now, of course, you're used to going here and going to a one-on-one -on -one preview, holding your, sp oh, holding your space bar isn't necessary, of course, in Lightroom. <laughs> Just move it around and then go to fill or fit or whatever you want. But with touch, you can actually also do it like this. You can, of course, just touch. But that isn't all, of course. Now you see this, this is pretty small, right? So you can use your pen, of course, and change this around. But let's say you go like, oh man, I don't really like this, it's too small. Can you change that? Yes, you can. Over here, you see a little thing with a finger. And watch this. Now I'm in touch mode, so I can change my pictures. And now this you know, of course, from your iPad or iPhone or whatever. You can just, oops. That's always because of the video, of course. You can run exposure and just change this, just the way you do on your iPad or iPhone or any other device. And of course, double click and it resets again. So touch mode also very, very interesting in Lightroom Mobile. And now I don't have to sync it with internet that's with us always slow and in hotels. So we can just keep it on the same device and edit your uh, pictures on the go. Oh yeah, switching from operating system. Going from Mac to Windows. Where's my computer? Where are my apps? Where is everything? Ah, stop complaining, come on. You get a really nice device. Come on, Apple user. We can figure this out, right? It's been way too easy for many years because with the Mac, everything's there. Now you have to work because you want some improvement in your workflow. I know the feeling. This is exactly how I felt the first time I booted up Windows. I was going like, Oh my, do I have to work with this? All, all the icons are over there and what does this do? Now I'm of course a little bit overplaying this because we are running Windows on some machines, so I know what I'm doing. But let's say you're a real Mac user, you're not really tech savvy and you have to switch over to Windows. The first thing I installed that really made a huge difference for me was Rocket Dock. Now with Windows, there is no rocket dock, you have to start menu, but that's horrendous. I don't know who designed that one. It certainly wasn't John Ivey, although I believe nowadays he's more into Christmas trees, but that certainly wasn't designed by somebody who knows about design. So the start menu, although nice in Metro look, it still isn't what we are used to. A rocket dock, free app, hey, I'm Dutch, and it really works great. Even if you start something up, you see that little bump that I really love about the Mac. So that was 
first thing. Another thing, of course, that you can experience when you switch from one OS to another is that your drives aren't compatible. Now, Windows, of course, uses FAT or FAT32, and that's all compatible. But most Windows machines nowadays use NTFS. Now, NTFS you can use on your Mac as read-only, and you can't write to it. Now, there are software solutions like Paragon that will actually make it possible to read and write to an NTF system on your Mac. And the other way is true. The other way also works. Paragon also released a software version a while ago, and I never experimented with it because for the very simple reason I didn't have a PC. But it also reads AHF+. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But that's the Mac format. So you just run the software. I believe it retails for about 20, 25 euros. And then you have it in your system. So you don't need to start up software to browse your drives. It's actually in your system. So it just recognizes like a normal NTFC drive. So that's really cool. The other thing that we missed was AirDrop. I love AirDrop. I love to AirDrop everything with Anaweek or with our team because it's very easy. You just pick up your iPhone and you have a new picture on your computer and you go like, oh, just AirDrop me that. And you go like, woo, and it comes into your phone. It's like magic. The only thing is it's not a really good magician because sometimes it just doesn't work and we go like, yeah, why doesn't it work? So you have to connect and disconnect and then it works. It, it could be our Wi-Fi. But we hear a lot of people that AirDrop isn't 100% great. So we actually found another app called Sapya. And again, it's free. You install it on your PC, on your Mac, on your iPhone, on your iPad or whatever. And up until now, I have to be totally honest, every single time we start the app, it works. There was not once that it didn't work. As long as we're on the same network, it works. Now, I don't know what happens when you do a near, um, how do you call it? If you're close to each other and you do the airdrop, which of course with airdrop does work, we never try that, but it's supposed to work. And the other thing that you might miss, and I don't miss it on the tablet, although it should be handy, is AirPlay. And actually our friends from AirParrot, who also have a version for the Mac, also have a version for the PC, where you can actually use your Air, AirPlay kind of solutions, like the Apple TV, and it's supposed to work. We still have to test this, so I'm downloading a, a trial at the moment. So we're going to test this in the coming weeks because I don't want to say it works as soon as I see an image. I really want to work with it and see how stable it is. So that also will be in the next video. But AirPlay does work to the Apple TV, it seems. There's also another solution called 5K Player. I played around with it. Now, I'm not dumb and I can't get it to work. I can play a video, but I can't mirror my desktop. And on the website, they're very vague about it. It should work, and, but I can't get it to work, so I actually deleted 5K Player again, and I'm going to go and test with AirParrot. The other thing is video editing. We, of course, as an Adobe evangelist, love Adobe products. But in all honesty, and I'm always honest, guys, in all honesty, Premiere is great. I always edit it in Final Cut Pro 7, and then I switched to Premiere because Final Cut Pro X was absolutely iMovie on steroids. I didn't like it at all. So I used Premiere, and Premiere is great. Then Final Cut Pro X actually caught up, and I fell in love with the magnetic timeline. It's stunning. You can just change clips, and of course you can do it in Premiere, but you have to hold keys, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So when I switched over to this one, I actually taught myself, you know what, before we're going to switch, we're going to work with Premiere on the Mac Pro, and we're going to work with Premiere here. On the Mac Pro, it works great. On this one, I found out that with the touchpad uh, performance in Windows, I didn't like the experience at all. It works. If you really need to do some work, it works great. But I missed Final Cut Pro. And this actually got me on a place like, okay, I want to switch over to Windows, also maybe for the computer in the studio, but that will be another video. And I don't really am perfectly comfortable with my Premiere performance on this device and in Windows. And then somebody pointed me out to something that I tried like half a year ago, DaVinci Resolve. Yesterday night, I installed DaVinci at around 11 o'clock. I went to bed at 3.30 because I absolutely loved the experience. Everything I liked about the magnetic timeline isn't back, but it's back for so much that I go like, I can live with this. And it's not like, nah, 
I can live with this now. It's like I'm totally enthusiastic about the product. I'm also going to install it on my Mac Pro to play with it because it does stuff that even Final Cut Pro X doesn't in color correction. It's literally very, very powerful. There's one thing you have to know. And if you want, I can do a separate video on it, but there are many, many good guides online. DaVinci Resolve doesn't read MTS files MP4s. So, well, it does read it, but it skips the audio. You need something called FFmpeg to really make sure that it, it reads a file format that you, well, that it's supported in Resolve. Now, you can of course buy something, but again, Dutch, so I, I want to have it for free. And I downloaded an Auto GUI and FFmpeg. Now, this isn't a Mac way of installing it, like pressing install and it works. You need to do some tinkering inside your uh, settings, but it's pretty easy to do. So the first thing you do is you empty your card and then you run it through FFmpeg, or in this case the GUI, and it will make files that are actually importable in Resolve. After that, it's a breeze to work with. It's very, very fast. Uh, you can see the previews on the screen without any stutters or whatever, even if you do some uh, filters on it. And exporting after that is actually quite fast. So very, very enthusiastic about Resolve. There's one thing left that I really are gonna miss on my Windows. And that's our friends from MacFun. MacFun over the years have become a very vital part of my workflow. I absolutely love their plugins, especially Intensify. And on Windows, there is no MacFun. Maybe Windows Fun? Somebody out there? Hmm? I don't know what to do. So I actually went back to Topaz. And Topaz has a really cool plugin called Topaz Clarity. Topaz Clarity does about 80% of what MacFun Intensify does. Now, that 80% is just what I needed because I didn't use the other 20% or 30% or whatever, but you know my meaning, right? So Topaz Clarity actually replaces MacFun Intensify. MacFun recently released a new plugin called Luminar. And I'm really, really hoping, and if MacFun, if you're listening to this, make sure you do it fast. I'm really hoping that MacFun will release Luminar on Windows because that plugin is absolutely awesome and could literally change the way that people work. The other filters I use, Image Nomic Portraiture, check, runs on Windows. Alien Skin Exposure, check, runs on Windows. DxO, check, runs on Windows. Lightroom, check, runs on Windows. The whole Adobe Suite runs on Windows. So overall, all the apps I use, I now have on Windows. So in the comments below, you will actually see some links to those apps. And if you're a Mac boy, like me, don't worry, most of the stuff you can find on Windows, but you have to look for it a little bit more than, well, on the Mac. Because I did find out that a lot of software that you download, they promise they work, but they actually don't. And with the Mac, it's more like you download something and you maybe like the interface or the integration, but they all work. And with the PC, I found out that a lot of software doesn't even run up or doesn't want to install or crashes or whatever. But if you find the correct ones, they're really stable. Okay, Capture One is a vital part of our workflow. And this is where everything went wrong. Now, Capture One is power hungry. It's a memory hog, it's a CPU yog, it's a GP, I don't know, whatever it's in that machine, it will eat it up alive, including your battery. But it's just the best program you can use for raw developing and of course for tethering. Now, it runs smoothly at the moment, but I had to change one thing. And it isn't a bad thing that I changed, but it's something you have to realize when you start using something like this, and you want to make sure that you get the real impression of the device. In Capture One, there's a setting for changing your thumbnails. Lower that setting to about 1280 or 1024. It's more than enough to see what you're doing, and you can still zoom in, of course, because it's zooming in on the raw file. But now you can also give the looks you want, change it and, it, and it's really instant. And if you go through all your files, it goes really fast. If you have the previews too high, like the standard is 2560, it really slows down the machine. And in essence, you don't need the preview at 20, uh, 2560. You don't need it there. So lower that down and you will see an increasing amount of speed for 
uh, giving looks, uh, changing your images, and of course browsing through those images. So that's the only thing we had to change in Capture One. All the other software runs as expected. And actually, it's also expected for Capture One to do this stuff. Calibrating a device is incredibly important. And this, of course, is a normal laptop monitor. Well, it's not really normal. It's 4K and it has 96% Adobe RGB, but it's still a monitor. So make sure that you calibrate your monitor. And we use uh, X-Rite Color Monkeys for this. That's a spectrometer and it's really, really accurate. Just place it in front of the screen and calibrate your screen. Just the way that you normally do with your PC or Mac. But make sure you do this. And we have a little tip for you guys, and we're going to do that in a separate video because we don't want this video to be too long. So there will be a separate video on calibrating this device with a little tip for you guys. Okay, so for drawing I use Manga Studio and as you all know, I'm not a digital artist. I'm just a photographer who loves to draw. So I actually drew Batman, love Batman. <laughs> and the cool thing is, it's very, very simple to get adjusted to this workflow. Because now if I want to zoom in, I can actually do this. And if I want to draw, uh, tilt my canvas, I can very simply do this. And in the meantime, just keep drawing. So this is a very natural way. And now I can actually use my dial only to change my brush size, which is absolutely stunning. Because now I don't have to change my dial settings constantly. And I can just move my file around, zoom in and tilt and draw. Okay, now pressure sensitivity is something that a real artist will probably use, and I'm not a real artist, but I'm going to show you anyway. Um, this is something with full line stabilization, so this should lag a lot. I'm hardly touching the screen now. And there we go. And you can see even with full image stabilization or line stabilization, it's pretty fast. Now let's turn that line stabilization off so you can see what it can really do. And I always say if you can write your name, it's fast enough. There we go. So I think the parallax is really great, the touch sensitivity is great, but most importantly, when you draw, you really feel the tactical feel of the glass. It, it has a little bit of a bite to it, and that's something that a lot of people love because it reminds them of paper. And I can only concur, it's not like feeling you, you drift over glass, it really has a nice tactical feel. Now the reason I'm using Manga Studio, by the way, or Clip Studio Paint is because I'm not very stable. So when I do a drawing and I draw a line, it will jitter a little bit. And in Manga Studio, you can actually put on line stabilization, <laughs> which actually saves my life because now the lines are a lot better. So if you zoom in, you can actually see this is the line that the artist Frank does, and this is the line that the artist Frank does when he's helped by the studio. So that saves me a lot of trouble by creating line art. Okay, so if you're still watching, you're probably very interesting in the Mobile Studio Pro. And I am too. My conclusion so far, it's a game changer, without any doubt. This is the device that Apple should have brought on the market. It's 2016 at the moment, almost 2017. I want to be able to travel with one device that does all. Where I can draw on, paint, where I can create on, where I can answer emails, surf the internet, and do whatever I want. I don't want to be limited by gear. I want total freedom. I want total creative freedom. I want my freedom to express. The MacBook Pros are great devices. I'm afraid that Apple is going to lose a lot of the creatives for the very simple reason they don't innovate enough. I don't want an emoticon bar, emoticon bar. I don't need that. It takes my eyes off the screen and I don't want a smaller laptop. I want more battery power. I don't want a laptop that has problems with the GPU because it's pushed too hard. I don't need that stuff. I need professional gear. Build quality of the Wacom is great. I don't know what it does when it travels with me around the world, if it still works, if it breaks down. I don't know. We'll see in the future. There's one thing that I have to address before I end this video. I told you about another product we're working on. Just to give you an idea how impressive the Mobile Studio Pro is and how fast 
Microsoft has grown over the last years. The day before the release of the MacBook Pro, Microsoft showed something to the public that absolutely stunned me. The Surface Studio. It isn't the stuff that I want in my studio because I don't like the Microsoft stylus. I think the, the Wacom styluses are way better. But imagine this, that's a game changer. You have a device similar to a Wacom Cintiq with a computer inside where you can draw on. I think a lot of people that want to start drawing will have a great device with that and grow later on to the Wacom products or maybe to a Microsoft product that's way better than the first incarnation. It did make me think, what if, and then it started to dawn on me, Anawix laptop is about 800 euros more expensive than the previous one. The 15 inch MacBook is about 1000 euros more expensive than the previous one. This Mac Pro, which I bought in 2013 at the moment with the same specs, exactly the same specs, is 1000 euros more expensive. I have to work very, very hard to afford the stuff that I want to use. If the new Mac Pro comes out, what will the price be? Six and a half thousand for the step-in model? I can build a PC for about 3,000 euros that will literally obliterate my Mac Pro that's now valued at about five and a half thousand euros. The Wacom Mobile Studio Pro is such a cool device and it really opened my eyes for what Windows can do that we're now thinking about our main machine, the production machine that does video editing, to get a second machine next to it that's actually running Windows. I never thought when I started the review for Wacom that this device would actually change my whole way of thinking about the future. A few years ago, if somebody told me like, Apple is going to leave the creatives and Windows is going to take the creatives, I would have said you were stark raving mad. At the moment, I think, when I see the touch interface of Photoshop, when you see Lightroom running in tablet mode, that's absolutely awesome. On this device you can run Lightroom in normal mode and you can run it in tablet mode. Think about that on a plane with a 13 inch, because this one is a little bit too big maybe on the plane, and just editing your files in tablet mode on Lightroom without the syncing that you have to do with your iPad Pro or your iPad. And you have every single power of Lightroom, all your raw files. And you come back and you put it on the normal mode and you continue editing. Now that's a seamless integration for creatives. Not getting all those files via internet, that's incredibly slow on your iPad. Having a limited amount of things you can do because the presets aren't there. Now you have everything on one device, but if you don't need a keyboard or you, you want a bigger interface, just switch it to tablet mode. Maybe Photoshop will have a tablet mode in the future. Maybe Resolve will have a tablet mode. I don't know where the future is going, but at the moment, I think the future might be Windows. Will we switch over completely to Microsoft? No way. We're going to build one machine and we're going to do a video on that. And we're going to see what that machine does. But for now, the intention was to do a review on the Mobile Studio Pro 16 and maybe use it for three or four months and give it back to Wacom. It's actually going to stay. This is my new mobile device. I'm not going to use the MacBook Pro anymore. I'm totally switching to this one. Will I leave my MacBook Pro at home? Not at first. The first two workshops on uh, location will actually have this one in the bag and this one with me. I'm now actually touching my MacBook, I don't know if you see that. But we'll have this one with me. But this one will be my main shooting machine. And if I don't touch the MacBook Pro for at least two trips, the MacBook Pro will stay home. And of course, Anna Week still has a backup MacBook Pro. The conclusion, without any doubt, if you're into the market for a creative device, I don't know any device that's better than the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a very lengthy one, so if you watched till the end, you probably liked it. Leave your comments below and let me know what you would like to see more and maybe we can add some more extra videos. And anyway, there will be more uh, videos about the power and the calibration, that's a promise, and we'll do that very soon. Thank you so very much for watching. My name is Frank Dorov, watch online, and of course, subscribe to our channel.